Bregan is the risk of polypharmacy used to modify the behaviour of children. And that's not assessed by parents uh, because of this selective transmission of knowledge which has created a belief and of safety and trust in the science of medicine. The school systems in my country and in your country have significantly influenced this selective transmission of knowledge. There's been promotion by the hegemonic medical model through dissemination of written material uh, and direct promotion to teachers by medical experts which has led teachers to believe that any child fidgeting in their classroom has a mental disorder. This is highly disturbing. Teachers and school systems have become part of this consensus of experts and this creates a situation whereby they act to influence parents to use the hegemonic medical model for treatment of the conditions that are essentially educational problems. The risk has also been created that now that any behaviour problems in schools are now seen as medical problems of individual students. What this has done is create a risk that schools and teachers can abdicate their responsibility for adequate classroom and playground management. And that certainly was evident in the data in my study. Schools and teachers working in this consensus with the hegemonic medical model create a risk that parents, as in 1970, against their will, are forced to medicate their children, even when parents stress that their children are having serious side effects from the medication. There was one example uh, in my study where the parent was going back to the school saying these drugs are affecting my child. Uh, and the response really, they brought in a, a medical specialist into the school situation and they said, oh, we'll change the medication, we'll up the dose. That was the solution given. The other thing that comes up within this when we look at it in the school system is that even a child who does one thing wrong at school, right, one mild problem or one instance of a serious behaviour problem are now forced into this model of treatment that labels and medicates them as if they have a permanent disability. This was a really interesting risk that I unearthed in the study and this uh, also became evident in schools I visited in the United States. Teachers who are ADHD or bipolar create a risk that due to their own strong beliefs concerning the disorder and treatment with medication that every child presenting with any problem of attention or behaviour in their class will be seen as ADHD and in need of diagnosis and treatment. I had a very interesting experience when I first came to the United States and uh, I did a presentation in Oconee County in South Carolina. Uh, this was long before I knew Peter Bregan and became involved with this organisation. And I'd been invited uh, uh, to uh, give community presentations after a visiting academic from uh, South Carolina uh, attended one of my lectures in Australia. <coughs> And before I uh, went to give this community presentation, they took me around to a public school, uh, elementary school. And uh, I was in the staff room and started talking to the staff within the school. And what became apparent within a very short period of time in the conversation was that virtually every teacher in the school was on some form of medication. They were either on Prozac or on Ritalin or some other uh, mind-altering drug. Now, the figures that David Healy put up there this morning in terms of the millions of people in the United States on the, this form of medication, uh, you know, is a major concern. If you've got teachers whose views on life are so distorted in this way, how are they viewing children? They're viewing normal children as abnormal. And this is clear and evident in the findings from my study. This is a really interesting risk that um, certainly has not been really dealt with at all and uh, the way my country has dealt with it, uh, I feel shame on my own country. It's clear that amphetamines in sport uh, are banned substances. They were one of the first banned substances. And the reason they were, the, the, you know, the multiple reasons why they were banned. One is they impair judgment and some of the worst accidents in sport have come about as a result of people using amphetamines. 
The second reason they're banned within sports and banned by the IOC is that a normal, perfectly fit athlete taking a normal dose of amphetamine, going to maximum exertion, have had heart attacks and collapsed and died. Now this became evident in uh, the cycling races in the 1960s where I think it was in one race there were three or four deaths in the one race from the use of amphetamines. Now these have been banned in sport but all of a sudden we have children who are diagnosed with ADHD who are playing sport under the influence of amphetamine and it's been allowed. I wrote a paper in Australia in 1996 you know, questioning this, saying, what should we do about amphetamines in school sport? The response from the medical profession in my country under the National Health and Medical Research Council had to respond to that particular paper. They said there was not enough research in the area. And they took a really quite interesting step. Because in my country, under the laws, every, even down to junior athletics, the ban on amphetamine was bound under law and under IOC regulations. So the National Health and Medical Research Council in my country wrote to the IOC and asked for an exemption on the ban for children under the age of 17. Uh, this is quite disturbing that uh, we ban adults from the use of amphetamines in school, in sport, in any form of sport, yet here we bent the rules changed them and said that children under the age of 17 can play sport under the influence of an amphetamine drug. Now a far more responsible uh, you know, uh, way of dealing with the issue uh, would have been to say to parents, look there's a risk that your child's going to be damaged as a result of this. They didn't deal with that. They didn't say to the parents, well look it's probably best not to give the amphetamine four hours before they play sport. Why do they need an amphetamine while they're playing sport? I mean, the amphetamines are used for behavioural control, the treatment of learning disability, supposedly in classrooms. They're not necessary in a sporting situation. But they didn't want to give the drug a bad name. They didn't want to bring to the attention of parents the real risk of what is really happening to their children. The other thing that came up in my study, and it's come up elsewhere, is that uh, abuse of the drug by parents taking their child's medication is quite significant. Uh, there were many reports by teachers uh, in my study where the child had been diagnosed as ADHD, had been given the medication, but the medication never turned up at school. The medication was taken by the parents. Abuse by adolescents who were diagnosed with ADHD was evident in the study. Supply of amphetamine to other adolescents by ADHD students was evident. And we have far more stringent regulations in terms of supply than the United States. So I assume the problem here is even far worse. And the other interesting thing that came up was that the use of medications as an educational performance enhancing drug to be used at specific times including examinations in order to improve in, uh, uh, in performance. And these things are all indicating with this whole area of significant and varied risks of substance use disorder as a result of the uh, medical intervention using amphetamines in children. The key risks that I really identified within the study in the final analysis was this. <clears throat> and it's a question that was asked in 1970 and still hasn't been answered to today. Does the labeling, labeling and treatment of children with ADHD or uh, with the hyperkinetic reaction to childhood as it was called in 1970 lead to a better long-term outcome for the child? The critical question concerning the possibility that the labeling and treatment of the child as ADHD potentially produces a worse outcome for the individual in the long term is not answered at this point in time. The fact that that was raised in your US Congress in 1970 and still not answered today is an indictment on your own political process and it's also an indictment on my country not to have stood up and really looked at this rationally before um, letting it take hold in the way it has. 
In areas in my country, we are already exceeding the level of diagnosis of many areas of the United States. And that's particularly the state Western Australia, where uh, general practitioners are allowed to prescribe the medication. In most of the other states, it's restricted to pediatricians and psychiatrists. Parental lobby groups such as CHAD have had significant influence in Australia and they continually put out this statement that children who are untreated have a significantly worse outcome than those who are. Now I emailed CHAD uh, uh, on 5th of June last year and said, well look, what's your supporting arguments? What's your references that actually support that? And they came back with this. They, they said, well look, the MTA study shows this. Uh, and the work of Beatham and Willens and Ferrone in their study, which has really been put together, I think, to uh, discount Nadine Lambert's work, and uh, particularly the work of, Nani, of Russell Barclay, and they gave me the reference to his book. Um, review of those supporting references uh, don't support the Chag claim. Does this treatment improve or worsen outcomes? The question, after all the research into the ADHD, and the use of drugs for the treatment over the past 40 years remains unanswered. And I think that says a lot about medical research and, and the forces behind this particular treatment. At the best, in terms of the evidence, uh, there's a risk that the, the treatment makes no difference at all. At the worst, it's damaging. Risk society in ADHD. Beck's analysis is really much more about the broader society, but ADHD clearly demonstrates Beck's analysis of the risk society. We've seen globalization of the treatment and we're seeing individualization of social control using drugs for behavior modification in childhood, the two characteristics that are evident in the ADHD uh, phenomenon. Giddens and Pearson, uh, who are uh, English sociologists, note that the idea of risk is bound up with the aspiration to control and particularly with the idea of controlling the future. In risk society, and that's the society we're living in, the focus on social and scientific activity becomes preoccupied with future scenarios and safety through minimization of risk. Children who are identified as ADHD are seen at, as at risk in terms of their current performance. And it is claimed by the hegemonic medical model, the biopsychiatry uh, model, that deviancy in adulthood will result if they're not treated. The, this medical intervention becomes one of individualized drug treatment aimed at preventing what was called in the 1970 inquiry in the US House of Representatives the development of malignant personality disorder in adulthood. One of Beck's observations about uh, unawareness of risk is it's created by this consensus of experts who